Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the hearings of the International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racist, uh, Systemic Racist Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the United States. These hearings are a process by which witnesses can present accounts of unjustified killings and maimings of Black people by police officers in the United States before an international panel of human rights experts. Uh, we now begin the hearing in the case of Tamir Rice. My name is Priscilla O'Chen, and I am the rapporteur for this hearing. Presiding over this hearing today are Commissioners uh, uh, Roberts, uh, Sir Claire Roberts of Antigua, and Commissioner uh, Uwaifo, Hannibal Uwaifo of Nigeria. Uh, the witnesses for this hearing are Attorney Billy J. Mims and Samaria Rice, uh, the mother of Tamir Rice. There will be 50 minutes for this hearing. Witnesses will testify, followed by a period of questions from commissioners. I will call time at the 30 minute mark and at the 45 minute mark. Uh, please excuse my interruptions. Uh, Commissioners Roberts and Awaifo, I now present, present to you your first witness, uh, Attorney Billy J. Mills. Uh, Mr. Mills, uh, please confirm your name. Sure, thank you also for the, just in general, for the opportunity to present this case and for everyone's time and, and efforts in organizing. Uh, just, just, before you, just before you begin though, can you confirm your name? Yes, my name is William Joseph Mills or Billy Joe Mills. Thank you very much. Do you promise that your testimony to the Commission of Inquiry will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Tamir Rice was a boy of 12 years old who was playing in a park called the Cadell Recreation Center in 2014. He was playing with a replica of, of a, he was playing with a toy gun. A person in the park called 911. That person relayed to 911 that he was probably a juvenile and that it was probably a fake gun. The 911 dispatcher did not relay that information to the police officers. Two officers, officers Frank Garmbach and Timothy Lohman arrived on the scene first. They hopped the curb, they hopped the curb that led up to the park to Cattell Recreation Center and they drove within feet of the gazebo under which Tamir was playing. Before the car even came to a stop as it was sliding on the grass, Timothy Lohman, who was essentially a rookie officer, he had only been on the job for, for less than a year, jumped out of his car and within two seconds um, fired at Tamir. Um, Tamir's sister, Tajay, shortly, shortly thereafter, who she was playing at Cadell Recreation Center as well, ran to Tamir's aid. She was tackled to the ground, prevented from giving any kind of comfort or medical aid to Tamir. The officers did not provide medical aid to Tamir. The first person to provide medical aid was an FBI agent who just coincidentally happened to be uh, near the scene at that time. The, the officers, uh, the officer who drove the vehicle, Frank Garmbach, was, um, had been with the Cleveland Police Department for a number of years, and he had received uh, civil rights violations before that had uh, led to at least one civil rights lawsuit against him. However, um, no significant disciplinary actions were taken against him. Timothy Lohman was an officer with the Independence Police Department. And he was essentially forced to resign from that department before he even began his job. Uh, his training officer described him as emotionally unstable and incapable of handling a firearm. However, the Cleveland Police Department did not review the independent, upon Timothy Lohman's application to the Cleveland De Police Department, they did not review the Independence Police Department's um, personnel files. They did not make that request. 
Uh, and so Timothy Lohman was allowed to get a job with the Cleveland Police Department, uh, a department he should have never been employed with to begin with. Can I, can I, can I stop, Billy? I like to say something just to help help out a little bit. Is is that okay, Miss Ocean? Well, uh, um, it's perfectly fine for you to, to add. If it would be, if it's okay with you, I'd like to let uh, Billy finish, and then you'll be right after him. If that's okay. But you can, you can, if it's quick, go go ahead, and then I'll, I'll go right back to Billy. I just wanted to okay. help clear some things up. So I'm Samaria Rice, mother of Tamir Rice. Um, and just to clear little things up, um, there was a few 911 calls called that day, but the particular 911 call Billy is talking about was made by a man that was drinking a beer in the park under the gazebo, okay? Let's be clear, he was drinking a beer under, under the gazebo at the park he said that it was a juvenile and it looked like a fake gun. Okay, that was um, the 911 caller to the dispatch. Somehow the dispatch um, did not relay the correct message to the officer, which caused um, them to um, react as it was a 20 year old male um, that had a gun in the park. That's what the dispatch relayed to the police officer. He, she never said it was a juvenile. She never said it was a fake gun. So um, let's be clear on that. Um, as, 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 um, as my daughter was the third person on the scene after the two officers was on the scene, my daughter was the third officer, I mean, the third person on the scene, when she was tackled on handcuffed and placed in the back of the car to watch her brother die right there. Um, and as they approached the scene, they never came in through the driveway entrance. They jumped over it. They ran over a hill, which jumped the curve and slid and shot my son less than a second. Okay. Um, the park lights was still on. The brake lights was still on. The window was rolled up. He could have never told Tamir to put your hands up no times. The tape proves that he was shot less than a second, not two, one, less than one second. Um, I just want to help clear some things up. Um, go ahead, Billy. Go ahead. I, I'm just- Thank I just you. Want to Thank you, Ms. Craig. Okay, and, and I'll come to you right after um, uh, Mr. Mills finishes his uh, remarks. Uh, you'll be able to uh, speak as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank Mills. You. Of course, thank thank you, Ms. Rice, for for those clarifications. And you're correct. One of the one of the most important details is that Timothy Loman claims that he ordered three times for Tamir Rice to put his hands up. However, from the video, it is clear that that is a fictional interpretation of the events as the events happened so quickly that it would have been impossible for three commands to have been ordered. Uh, and as Ms. Rice also alluded to, the windows were rolled up to the vehicle. So um, there was simply no time for uh, Tamir to react to any orders that were given and were incredulous as to whether any orders were given at all. Um, the fact is, is that Tamir was was playing in a park and there was no danger to Tamir or to other kids in the park until those officers arrived. And so there, the officers created the danger. They, they created a danger out of whole cloth. There, there simply was no uh, emergency for the officers to respond to. And the way in which they responded to it gave themselves no opportunity to um, let me let me clarify that the way Frank Garmbach approached Tamir was a highly improper police maneuver. As part of our civil rights case against the city of Cleveland, we hired um, a number of experts. A couple of them were former police officers, police chiefs, uh, who described the way in which Frank Garmbach's approach of Tamir was a highly improper police maneuver. And it's, it essentially created a danger for the rookie officer, Timothy Lohman, uh, where 
if they had simply stopped at an appropriate distance of 100 feet away and, and presented orders at that point, the situation would have de-escalated rather quickly. <sighs> Following the, the murder of Tamir Rice and the tragedy that occurred, we, th that is sort of the first set of failures, right? That is the first set of failures is the, that we described in which the officers were, you know, Timothy Lohman was hired. He should have never been hired. Frank Garmack had previous civil rights allegations against him. He was never disciplined in any serious way. So following, following the murder of Tamir Rice, the next sort of phase of injustice begins, which is Timothy uh, McGinty, who is the um, prosecutor, the chief prosecutor in Cuyahoga County at that time, presented the case against the officers to a grand jury. However, uh, the way in which he presented the case essentially sabotaged and undermined the case he was presenting, and he intended to do so. And he later said uh, he recommended to the grand jury that they not move forward with indicting the officers, with, with presenting a, a true bill to indict the officers. So um, that round of things, uh, we were also we were allowed to present, I believe, two or three of our experts at the grand jury. Those experts described being treated in an incredibly hostile way by the prosecutors, including, you know, one of them pointing a toy pistol at one of our experts and, and things like that. So um, it was clear that the the prosecution had absolutely no interest in in actually creating any kind of criminal accountability. Um, the officers were allowed at the grand jury to read written statements. This is an important detail from a legal standpoint because they were allowed to prepare statements, give them to the grand jury. However, the prosecutors did not cross-examine the officers in the statements that they made. And so when the, grand, the, the officers could have taken the fifth, um, however, they chose to give statements. The, the prosecutor, because they have so much discretion in the American legal system, chose not to cross-examine the officers, even though the officers left themselves vulnerable to, that, to such a cross-examination. Uh, and we believe that the grand jury was also never informed that they could have asked cross-examination questions of the officers. Um, so at the grand jury simply, you know, uh, uh, similar to actually to what just happened, which is, and I'll get to this, but the Department of Justice more recently announced that their investigation um, would, had come to a conclusion with a finding that the officers not be charged. And that finding was, was announced in between Christmas and, and New Year's. I believe McGinty's announcement uh, and I'm thinking back a number of years now, I believe McGinty's announcement was also made in between Christmas and New Year's, um, you know, at a rather inconvenient time and at a time when, you know, perhaps people are more focused on family than the news and, and rightfully so. Um, the, the, the sort of, so, okay, the grand jury process was completely sabotaged and undermined by the prosecution. Then the internal administrative disciplinary process within the Cleveland Police Department that was supposed to you know, provide perhaps some measure of accountability, though certainly not the kind that, that Ms. Rice and the Rice family has sought. Um, they suspended Frank Garmbach for a handful of days. He appealed that decision and they reduced it to something like two or three days. Timothy Lohman was fired from his job. He was terminated, however, not because he murdered a, a child, Tamir Rice. He was fired because he lied on his application, which is also in part, he, the reason he was able to lie on his application is because of the failure of due diligence um, from the Cleveland Police Department in, in hiring him uh, and not looking into his record at the Independence Police Department. Um, the Department of, to, so to go back to the Department of Justice investigation, we met with the Department of Justice. They conducted, and this was during the Obama administration, that was when they were beginning their investigation and building the case. 
what we know now from right before the uh, most recent election in the United States, there was a whistleblower who came forward from within the Department of Justice who said there are career prosecutors within the Department of Justice who wish to go forward with prosecuting these officers, with forming a grand jury to investigate and to potentially go forward with charges against the officers. However, what the the whistleblower revealed is that political appointees um, made by the Trump administration appear to have sabotaged that um, attempt for the career prosecutors to go forward with a prosecution. So the, the career prosecutors twice recommended to, um, to their higher ups that they be allowed to move forward with, with forming a grand jury. Um, and twice that request was essentially ignored for many months and over a year uh, and then finally denied. And it, to be clear, it is a routine thing to, to sort of rubber stamp those requests when a career prosecutor has spent months and years building a case and building a file and then makes a serious recommendation to move forward, um, particularly when police officers are involved because it is uh, unfortunately considered in the United States such a uh, that the police officers are even though they enforce the law that they for some reason ought not to be held to the same standards of legal and criminal accountability. Um, so as I mentioned the Department of Justice did um, officially provide us with notification that they are that they have come to a conclusion with their investigation and that they have found um, that the officers did not violate the federal civil rights standards necessary to go forward. Um, the other key part of that was the uh, potential for obstruction of justice charges to be brought against the officers. Again, mostly focused on the idea that Timothy Lohman created a fictional account of the, uh, of the crime that, he, that we believe he committed um, by, by, again, essentially claiming that he ordered multiple times for Tamir to raise his hands. However, again, the video proves that that is simply an impossibility. So, um, you know, he continued to repeat that lie even after it came to light that that video of, of the crime existed. Um, the so the justice has been denied to the Rice family at every single level of government at the county level with the prosecutor, the state has failed to intervene. Um, it's possible for the state to, uh, to point, appoint an independent prosecutor or to put pressure on the local county prosecutor to, to refer the case out. Uh, and now the federal government has, has failed to hold the officers accountable. We are still trying. There is the, the, the statute of limitations has now run out on obstruction of justice charges at the federal level. Um, it has not run out at the federal level on the use of force um, charges that we, you know, the, the primary uh, charges that we wish to see brought. Um, and there is still about 10 months left at the county level for obstruction of justice charges to be brought against the officers. Um, the other sort of mechanism at play here is that the police union has, has a very uh, you know, they have deep coffers, they have a lot of power, and they have protected the officers every step of the way from a legal and PR standpoint. Um, so again, there's still time to get justice for Tamir on the obstruction of justice charges uh, at the county level and, and potentially the use of force charges at the county level or the state level if they were to intervene. However, we've communicated with the county prosecutor and he has been completely um, uh, unwilling to move forward with, uh, with charges against the officers. There, there's a new prosecutor in office, largely in part because of the backlash against Prosecutor McGinty for his handling of, of Tamir's case. Um, so that is, that's an overview of things. I hope I've left enough time for Ms. Rice and for questions uh, later on, but this is a, a tragedy that's been compounded 
at multiple levels of government. There are multiple failures. And the Rice family, we do feel, has been failed every step of the way. Uh, and so we appreciate the opportunity to present this case to the United Nations and to the people here because it, it appears that the avenues that ought to be left to us within the United States are um, ha have been stymied every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioners uh, Roberts and Weisbaum, uh, I now present to you our second witness, uh, Ms. Samaria Rice. Uh, Ms. Rice, uh, can you uh, please confirm your name? Samaria Rice. Uh, do you promise that your testimony to the Commission of Inquiry will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Rice. Uh, you may begin. Well, I just wanted to clear some things up um, from, from, from my standpoint. And if anyone had um, any questions or clarification, um, as I was, as I was um, saying that, um, like I said, my daughter was placed in the back of the car to force to watch her brother die. Um, they didn't know if she knew CPR to help get her brother some type of um, emergency uh, care at the time. They didn't even know. Um, I couldn't even attend to her. Um, none of the children, none of the children, because I was given an ultimatum to either stay at the scene of the crime or leave with my 12 year old in the back of an ambulance. So I choose to leave with my 12 years old riding as a passenger in the front seat when it was about five or six people in the back with my son and I don't know what they were doing. I had to leave two children at the scene of a crime, a 14 year old screaming in the back of a car and my 16 year old surrounded with eight police officers. Timothy Lohman should have never been a police officer. His father was a U.S. Marshal. Um, his father was friends with Chief Calvin Williams of the Cleveland um, Police Department. So that's how he became a, um, a somebody is noisy on, on the back end. Okay, so um, that's how he became a Cleveland police officer because his father was a U.S. Marshal. And like I said, the chief of police and the father were good friends. So that's why he was able to slid through the cracks. Nobody checked his HR report. He was coming from independence, like Billy said, um, with a horrible record of breaking down on the gun range, crying over his girlfriend. His mother had to come and get him one time being reckless with his firearm and, and his um, bulletproof vest. Like it's detail, detail, um, you know, things in there stating that he would, he can never be re, re, he, he, re, uh, rehabilitated. And to be a police officer, felony sheriff's test or felony police test five times. Like he was a horrible person. He should have never been a police officer. And just like Billy said, he was employed less than a year. I say six months, six months and I had a dead son. So he should have never been a police officer um, in nobody's police department. Um, Frank Granback was the driver. Um, previous records, he had just assaulted an African-American woman, slammed her on her head. The, the police paid her not to say anything. I tried to approach her, but she wouldn't talk to me, but we could have built a case against uh, Frank Granback together, but the lady wouldn't talk to me. So not only do you have Frank Granback that should never have been a police officer or FOT trainer, you have a rookie officer that um, his father just say, hey, put him on the force and things like that. Um, I just also wanted to clear up some things. Um, you know, I think Billy kind of cover all of the legal aspect of things, but, um, you know, me and my children had to go in front of the grand jury, which was a very, very scary process. My children, my daughter came out crying. My son was angry and I was shooken up. We, they 
brought us in there separately. And um, they, they, when we were in there, at least when I was in there, they were trying to make it seem like it was my fault um, that Tamir was dead. Like, like they were trying to blame us and things like that. So, you know, um, that was just horrific. And, and, and when I want to also, what I want to say about the state of Ohio is that it's an open carry state. They don't know if my son had a, a, a registered to carry, um, you know, as, as they thought that he was a 20 year old man, um, they should have approached it with, um, like when somebody called for a felony call, you know, they call and say it's a man out there with a gun, it instantly turned into a felony call. They didn't approach it like a felony call because if you approached it, you would have never got that close to my son because you would have been fearing your own life. You know what I'm saying? They never came in the driveway correctly or anything. So they did not approach it as a felony call when the lady broke, when, when a dispatch um, said that it's a 20 year old male with a gun in the park. They didn't approach it as a felony. You know, that's like, that's a felony call. So that's, that's uh, one of the laws in Ohio. They have to approach it as a felony call. If you get that call, you approach it as a felony call. And then if you thought it, if you thought it was a grown man in the park, you, for one, you wasn't scared and you didn't even see if he was registered to carry. You just pulled on him like the wild, wild west. So it was a lot of um, protocols and procedures broken that day. And I have no accountability for any of it. Um, the DOJ quietly closed the case stating um, in the 15 page document, some of the document talking about the tape wasn't clear, it was fuzzy, it was greedy or whatever. Use all of the expert enhanced equipment that you have in America to enhance the video for you could see it crystal clear because evidently everybody else seen it crystal clear across the seven continents. You know, they say my son name across the seven continents I didn't make that happen. The media made that happen. So um, use your enhanced video to see it clear. Like we have a lot of videos of a lot of these murders um, committed by law enforcement. And we already know that it has been infiltrated with white supremacy. So um, they need to use the equipment to see the things crystal clear. And, um, do the right thing by the powers to be. Um, you know, I just wanted to thank y'all for giving giving me the opportunity as y'all gave a lot of us opportunities to be a part of this. And they're committing genocide on American citizens in this country. And, um, you know, it's, it's just not right. It's just not right. Um, I was living in a bubble before this. Six years ago, I was just raising my kids, minding my business, trying to do the right thing, you know? And um, this has knocked on my door and this has been my life ever since. You know, I was a stay at home mom, just trying to make sure I focused on my kids, invest in my children, for they won't have to come from a hard knock life like myself. I come from a very broken home, so I invested in them. And, to, and right now, this day, I have three high school graduates. Two of my kids were still in school when Tamir was murdered. So this is not easy and have to be going around the world, um, keeping the awareness, keeping people uncomfortable. You know, that's just what I'm supposed to do. And I think that's what God want me to do. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, I just want people to understand that in this country, we are being... Um, murder and they're committing genocide on American citizen with police terrorism and um, a, a whole bunch of other stuff in this country. Like the constitution is not working in this country for none of us. Um, I think it needs to be thrown away and redone over um, some things of that nature. You know what I'm saying? It's just systematic failure um, after failure, after failure, after failure, it, it, it seems as it has been designed for American citizens to be this way in this country, and it's not right. And, you know, my son was just, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, I, I thought you were concluding. Go ahead, Ms. Frank. Oh, no. And I, no, I, I'm, I'm basically about done. I don't know if anyone have any questions. I mean, I mean, yeah, we could talk about this all day long and, you know, try to figure out what the solution is um, to these senseless murders that's stolen on behalf of law enforcement and the government in this country. This is ridiculous. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I just wanted to one say thank you very much, Ms. Rice, for your um, you know just you know heart wrenching testimony about uh, the loss of your the murder of your son. Um, and uh, on behalf of myself, I want to again offer my condolences um, uh, for for your loss. And I just also want to acknowledge how difficult uh, I'm sure it must be to have to relive this. Um, and, and I appreciate your courage in in speaking before. Uh, this panel today. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our commissioners, uh, Commissioner I have one. I'm sorry, uh, Sir I did Claire have Roberts. One. I'm sorry, I did have uh, one more thing to say. Sure, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I did want to make a, a clear some things up just a little bit. Um, on a state level, we have less than a year to um, file uh, an indictment for uh, obstruction of justice on a state level with um, pursuing perjury charges on Timothy Loman on a state level. Um, on the federal level, um, as Billy said, that we're trying to see if the new administration, um, you know, I'm asking for an appeal because one thing I can't understand with COVID coming in, COVID-19 coming in, how was anything was able to be, um, you know, how was they able to make a decision with COVID-19 coming in because I know for a fact some people didn't even go to court because of COVID-19. So how was a decision made? You know, I'm asking my attorneys, can we get an appeal because of the COVID-19? And, you know, if if their own administration found probable cause to convene a grand jury, why, why, um, why are we not there? And if the new administration could come in and make it right. So those are a few things. Um, that I would like to see um, done in Tamir's case. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rice. Um, uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to our commissioners, uh, Commissioner Roberts, Commissioner Waifu. Uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, for our witnesses, Mr. Mills, uh, or the other Tamir Rice, uh, uh, Tamaria Rice. Thank you, Professor. I wanted to inquire just a, a little curious as to why the reaction of the police to Taje trying to attend, it seems a natural action to her uh, brother who was, who was shot. Why, why that sort of fierce reaction? Um, just curious. Okay, so let me explain. So Billy um, said that Tamir was not a threat to anybody and he wasn't. I have the longer version of what happened that day. My son was out there playing with the BB gun, uh, fake gun, whatever. Um, other children were out there. Other children were out there too. They were all playing, passing it around. And everybody had went inside of the recreation center which is right there next to the park. Um, and Tajay also went inside to use the restroom. Um, somebody said, um, somebody been shot. So Tajay runs out the bathroom and she looks through the door and she seen it was her brother. She runs out the door and start, you know, she runs towards her brother and say, you shot, scream and say, you shot my brother, you shot my brother. And they tackle her. She run, you can see it, she runs straight up to the police car and they tackle her. Two big grown men tackle her and place her in the back of the police car to, and Tamir, and, you know, forced to watch Tamir die. I don't, I don't know why they tackle her like that. I don't know. And this one is from Mr. Mills. Um, Mr. Mills, I wonder, is there such a thing as a, private prosecution if the authorities don't prosecute? Is there such a thing in um, law of the state or? Um, Billy, and, and 
And Mr. Mills, just just a moment, uh, Ms. Rice, before you respond, uh, Mr. Mills and Ms. Rice, I just want to note, I, I should have done this a few minutes ago, but we're at about uh, uh, 8.37 or 11.37, and we have about 13 more minutes left um, uh, for this uh, hearing. So I just wanted to uh, note that so that we can be mindful about our questions and our uh, responses. Uh, so the question is about private prosecutions. I apologize, Ms. Rice, I think I interrupted you. So if you'd like to respond, then I'll go to Mr. Mills. No, I was telling him to respond. No, I'm good. Uh, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Professor. Um, in terms of private prosecution, there is there is no mechanism. The, the, the prosecutors that exist at the county level have a lot of discretion and power. So if there's any if there's going to be any criminal accountability at the local level based on state laws, it needs to go through the local county prosecutors. Again, the federal Department of Justice can also um, be involved with criminal accountability. In terms of any kind of private prosecution, that does exist on the civil side of things. It would not create criminal accountability. We did uh, file and settle a civil rights um, lawsuit against the city of Cleveland and against the officers. Um, so that provided some measure of financial incentive I think you would say to the Cleveland Police Department and to the city of Cleveland to reform their police department. However, it is a, you know, in our view, a much less direct form of accountability than criminal accountability. Um, that, you know, the, the punishment of the settlement was not felt directly by the officers. It was truly felt by the taxpayers um, and, and by the people who design budgets within the city of Cleveland, but not by the officers themselves. Uh, just, if you. I may just have one, apart from the financial settlement, uh, what other um, type of settlement would you want to see, not just for uh, the Rice family, and, and I want to say how sorry I am that uh, this they had to on, experience such an awful um, thing, and um, my condolences. But for instance, I was thinking of things like um, memorialization, some sort of uh, something to so that we remember uh, the incident, so it doesn't happen again. That um, it doesn't just go away, uh, and. Um, you know, um, perhaps an apology, a public apology. And uh, so that somehow or the other, these incidents are not uh, seen as routine and they, they're no longer front page. They, um, what other types of measures you think might, um, might be useful to arrest this sort of um, uncertainty? Okay, let me answer a little bit, Billy. Uh, well, in our settlement, we were able to, um, you know, get a part of Cadell Recreation Center and do a memorial over there for Tamir, which implements a plaque implemented in the ground made of marble and stone and two trees planted over there. And a butterfly garden was made over there in memory of Tajay, where she was tackled and handcuffed. So we were able to put some things in place uh, for people to remember Tamir and things like that. I also have a building that I purchased in 2018, um, turning it into Tamir Rice Afro Central Cultural Center, where we will be, be providing after school programming, uh, free after school programming for the community. And that was my way of giving back as well. Um, so I have been building Tamir's legacy up with the help of the community and the world support. And um, just to keep, you know, Tamir legacy and his name alive. Um, you know, I have ownership of the gazebo, which what Tamir was murdered at. And right now it's in um, Chicago at in um, Stony Island. Um, Theaster Gates um, was instrumental and getting it for me and just storing it and 
um, refurbishing it and, you know, keeping everything intact for me. So right now is, like I said, it's in Chicago um, at the art bank. You could kind of Google the art bank and you will see the um, gazebo out there. Um, so we're just, you know, I'm just um, trying to find a permanent place. If it's not going to stay in Chicago, we may try to talk to Brian Stevenson in Montgomery for the lynching museum. Uh, for the gazebo could go down there for it could be preserved and um, it's part of history It's where my son was murdered at it's the last memory of I have of him and things like that so it's some things that's happening but that's that's not enough you know we need to make example out of police departments law enforcement governments that think it's okay to kill our kids and go in the house and eat a ham sandwich it's not okay because my life is forever altered. My children's life is forever altered. My family is destroyed because of the murder of my son. You know, my family is destroyed. You know, the little bit of family that I had left, you know, because I come from a broken home, is destroyed. Now I'm here and my kids is there. Um, and I want an indictment. I want an indictment on Timothy Loman. I wish Frank Granback can do... Um, get one too because he had no business driving that car like that and you was the um you was the training officer so they both need to be in jail for the murder of my son there's no if and and bus about it everybody's seen it across the country the seven continents and you know you know i'm not gonna let up so will we we have some things in place like billy said we talked to the prosecutor he's not willing to do anything but Hopefully, I will, you know, hopefully the, one of my other attorneys will have a conversation with um, the prosecutor again to, you know, create the pressure and, you know, with the DOJ and, you know, some Congress help and hopefully you all help. We want to create the pressure for the state of Ohio to put an indictment on Timothy Lohman for, ne um, for um, the murder of my son. Yeah, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Y'all have to excuse me. It's just overwhelming. It's never easy to talk about this, you know, and, you know, and I'm doing the best I can these days. Thank you. I mean, you, your, your, your the testimony has been just amazingly powerful. And we, we appreciate um, you, you talking with us this morning. Um, commissioners, we are at about uh, 8.45 uh, California time, about 11.45. East Coast uh, time. We have about five minutes uh, remaining uh, for this hearing. Uh, do you have any remaining uh, questions uh, for our witnesses? Yes, yes thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mrs. Rice, uh, Samara Rice, I want to commiserate with you on behalf of the African Bar Association. I I am a bit worried uh, at on the news the reoccurring incidents of police brutality, police unjustified shootings, and then of course, the prevention of aid. They will provide the aid to victims. They have deliberately or accidentally shot, and they wouldn't allow any other person to provide aid. Is that legal in the United States or is it criminal? There are no charges, even if the police have managed to justify and cover up the criminal acts they committed. But what about this clearing one of holding a child down, stopping a, dog, a sister from assisting his teenage brother who has been shot by the police? Is it criminal? Are charges not? Are the police not also liable to that? The second question I want to ask. At the end of this very painful situation, I'm so sorry once again, Mrs. Rice. Mm -hmm. After this painful situation, after the rigmarole and rigmarole of the grand jury and all what, what is the crime of the child? What crime is the state saying that this child committed? Because the ends of justice demands that if you're not going to prosecute people 
for what they've done, if you are going to justify police action, you must tell us and you must tell the victims and their family what crime has been committed. Because I've read through the length and breadth of this, I haven't seen where the state or any of the prosecutor authorities have said this child has committed a crime. So people kill people, kill a child, and get away with it. The third question I want to ask is, are there no standards of dealing with children in the United States? So a police officer hears about a supposed crime, you enter into the place, no matter what you think it is, whether you were told it is a 40-year-old man, you're not blind, come on. And you arrive at the place, it's a child, and you open fire. And you kill the child. Come on, I'm beginning to wonder, are these all not just, you know, a, a, a institutionally deliberate, I mean, deliberate institutionalized mothers that pass through very flawed legal system that we call laws that have become a very big hindrance to the emancipation of the United States, to reaching the goals which the United States set out for itself. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, so, so, so there are a number of questions and we have just a few more minutes. So I just want to keep that in mind. So one of uh, the questions is, you know, what uh, was the alleged crime uh, that Tamir Rice uh, was supposed to have committed? Um, two, is, are there any standards uh, for dealing with the child? Um, and then three, is it a criminal uh, in and of itself uh, in terms of how the process unfolded? I think were the three questions and obviously yeah. we don't have enough time to get to all of them. So perhaps e each of you can pick one or two of those questions to respond to. Well, Tamir was not never charged with a crime. At first, before the video came out, they wanted to try to say that he was out there menacing, meaning he was out there scaring the people and everything. But that's not true because I have a video of what happened that day and he was talking to people walking back and forth from the rapid station with their groceries talking back and forth to the people the grown people that's walking because across the street from the park area is a rapid like public transportation so you have to walk through the park and people got to walk through the park so he was never out there menacing there was no charge and according to uh one of the attorneys if a child was 12 years and under, the officer was supposed to be charged with aggravated murder. So I don't, I don't know what happened. Maybe Billy can help clear that part up. I don't know. Billy? <clears throat> there's, no, there's no good way to make sense of it. Yes, the officers should have been tried. The prosecutors have so much discretion and power that regard, even if a crime is, viol even if a law is violated, the prosecutors still need to be willing to move forward with the charges. Um, so, and, and uh, to Commissioner Waifo, I really, I appreciate your impassioned comments. I, I do want to, I know that race is one aspect of the, uh, the commission's inquiry or a major aspect of it, or the primary aspect of it. So I do think there are some difficult questions we need to ask. Would the 911 caller have ever called if Tamir was a white child playing in the park? Would the 911 operator have conveyed more information to the officers such that, that Tamir was probably a juvenile playing with what is probably a toy gun? Would the officers have approached differently if Tamir uh, was a white child playing in the park? I think these are difficult questions. And, and then finally, on the legal end of things, to, to, to bring it back around, would the county prosecutor and the federal prosecution have gone forward if Tamir was a white child? Would those prosecutions have been more likely to have gone forward because of you know, the perception that a white child deserves more, um, uh, that, that would deserve, that the officers would deserve greater criminal accountability for murdering a white child than a black child? These are very difficult questions, but I think they need to be asked and, and explored. Yes, and Tamir's, he was violated. His human rights and civil rights was violated. And, um, you know, that needs to be answered, absolutely. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Mills, Attorney Mills. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rice, um, uh, for 
continuing to witness for your son. Uh, and thank you very much for participating in this uh, commission of inquiry. Uh, this concludes uh, the hearing of the case of Tamir Rice. Um, uh, we will resume hearings uh, tomorrow. Uh, again, thank you very much to our commissioners, Commissioner uh, Sir Claire Roberts, Commissioner Hannibal uh, Waifu. Uh, thank you very much for your attentive questions and concern about uh, the uh, uh, matter of police violence against people of African descent uh, in the United States. And with that, uh, we will conclude our hearing. Thank you. It's actually police terrorism. Yep. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.